we're grateful to have David Schramm here with us. And uh, he's going to be talking about tips on how to become better after experiencing the bitter. So overcoming hardships is essential to the wellness of a person and how they cope with their hardships. So by learning to become better after the bitter, David Schramm offers insight on the benefits and tools needed to become your best self. This presentation offers insight on how to come back after a pandemic and grow from the experience of, as we've talked about today. It also talks through the experience of experiencing mental health issues and ways to cope with it. David Schramm worked as a professor and extension specialist in the Department of Human Development and Family Science at the University of Missouri for nine years before joining the faculty at Utah State University in 2016. His research centers on couples, relationships, parenting, and flourishing at home and at work. He was appointed by the governor, uh, Herbert, to serve on the Utah Commission on Marriage in 2016, and he appears monthly on Fox 13's The Place, and has launched a Facebook page, Dr. Dave USU, where he shares research and tips on helping individuals, parents, and couples flourish. He's given over 500 presentations, classes, and workshops, to a variety of audiences from British Columbia to Beijing, China, from St. Louis to San Francisco. And I will note, travel here was much more pleasant than any of those, I'm sure. And outside of the classroom, he's a scientific consultant for businesses and organizations. He presents on topics ranging from positivity to productivity and parenting, from happy hacks to healthy habits, and from brain boosters to balancing work and family and building resilience and from motivation and mindfulness to marriage relationships. His approach is founded on decades of science showing that when people flourish in their personal and home lives, they are more invested and flourish at work. You can see his website at Dr. Dave Speaks, and he also has a TED Talk, uh, Family Fundamentals, The Secret Sauce to Booming Business. So join me in giving Dr. Dave Schramm a, a round of applause. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It was great traveling down here. It was. It was different coming down here last night than going um, catching a plane or anything like that. It was. It was wonderful. And the weather. This sure beats um, Logan, especially in the in the winters. Um, but this is this also. I, it was great to see faculty. Um, faculty that I know here. You have great faculty um, here at SUU and a little bit. Um, I ate at my parents yesterday afternoon as I was traveling down. They live in Payson, so I grew up in good old Payson, Utah. How many of you know where good old Payson? Yes, yes, Payson Lion, class in 95. Let's go. And so I ate there, and then I was talking with my, my parents, and my dad actually attended SUU. He began in 1962, 1962, graduated in 1966. He served a, a church mission over in Germany for three years. So this is a, kind of a coming, this whole full circle to be able to literally be where he was as a, it, many of you his age at that time, to, uh, to be able to come back here is, is pretty neat. Um, a little bit of his kind of little, little Dr. Dave, you know, where does that come from? So I graduated from Auburn University in Human Development and Family Studies, took a position at University of Missouri. Um, there is, as Brad talked about, for nine years. And I remember my f the first semester, first class, it was this huge class. And a few weeks into it, I remember coming home and saying, honey, it's the funniest thing, the students there, they call me Dr. Dave. And our daughter, she was about three at the time, or about five years old, another daughter was three, and she just started to giggle and laugh. I said, what's so funny about that, Mallory? And she said, dad, you're not a doctor. I said, actually, Mallory, I've been to 10 years of school. I'm trying to convince this five-year-old that I'm a doctor. She looks up at me and she says, Dad, you're not a doctor. You don't help anybody. I said, help your room, young lady, right? Why? What, what was she thinking? Why would she say that? Yeah, I didn't have the scrubs and didn't really help people, but I do, I promise, I do try to, to help people. A um, little bit about the Shram fam. We have three daughters and our son. Um, and so <laughs> right after this, I have to like zip back up. They're having a playoff game, Green Canyon at Skyview. Uh, and I'll go about 110 and just like see if I can get there <laughs> by six o'clock, which I'll be pushing it. Our, our oldest daughter, let me tell you a little story about our, our oldest daughter. I actually just texted her about 15 minutes ago. She was having bunion surgery. She's now 22 years old, lives in Orm. But let's rewind a little bit. There's an experience that I want to build on and, and start with. 
back in Missouri, she was a freshman, um, not extremely um, athletic. And she said, Dad, I, Mom, Dad, I want to run track. I want to run track. My friends are running track. I want to try out for the track team. I'm, I think she was 14 years old at the time. And we kind of looked at each other. And we're like, OK, yeah, you know, we'll support you. You go get them type of a thing. And we asked her what event. She said hurdles. And we said, are you sure? Yeah, does anyone, anyone run, run track in high school or here? Yes. Good. Why? <laughs> Why? No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't get it. Um, so we're super excited. She's excited. She says, are you going to come? Of course, we're going to come watch. So this is her very, very first track meet. And um, she gets in the blocks and she gets ready to line up. And I'm going to actually show, show you. So I, I don't have the sound on because I don't want to hear. <laughs> you just hear my voice be like, go, go, Jenna, go, go, go. So <clears throat> I'm going to spare you that. But this is, so she is, uh, she's on the far left, right? So whatever lane that is, on the far left, she's, now, <laughs> don't mind her freshman form, okay? This is, uh, this is not the best form, but here she goes. Oh man, there she goes, taking off and I'm videoing. And I had no idea how she would do. Look at that, look at those arms flailing around. <laughs> yeah, let's go girl. Okay, so she cruises down and she takes first place. And so I was like, oh yeah, that's my girl. See, honey, we're raising athletes. And I go down there and I'm, uh, you know, hugging her in front of everybody. And I'm, su I'm such this proud dad. My wife's down there we're like, man, we had, we had no idea, way to go. And so she was super pumped, super excited. And now here's a video of the very next track meet. And we, we talked to all of our you know, friends and neighbors and they're like, no, you gotta come. She's pretty good, man. She hauls, she takes after me, right? We knew she could do it the whole time. Where, well, that was not true. Okay, now here it is. She's in the same lane, all right? So same lane. This is the, the very next meet. And here she goes. Boom. She's cruising. Maybe not the lead, doing all right. Arms are falling all over the place. And then, boom. Yeah, so I don't have the, the sound on because that's the crowd, the sound that the crowd made. It was really loud. And she finishes uh, last, okay? So she went from first to last place in the two meets. This meet, she's obviously, she goes down there. I go running down there, right? And I, I see her, I look up, and her, her shoulder's starting to bleed, and her, legs, her leg is all just messed up, and it's starting to bleed. And I run down there, and she is just in panic mode. She's shaking. She comes up to me, and she says, Dad, I just want to go home. I just want to go home, Dad. I just want to go home. Just take me home. I, I don't want to be here. I'm like, whoa, whoa, Chandler, 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 Chandler. And she wouldn't even look me at the eyes. No, I want to go right now. She was humiliated. She was embarrassed. Her friends, family, all the people in the stands, at that noise that you guys made, it was 10 times louder. When you're, oh, she hit the deck and then just bounced back up and finished. She wanted to get out of there. I want to be done. I, I don't want to do track anymore. I hate this. And I grabbed her and I said, hey, 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 hey. I said, I am more proud of you today than I was last week. She said, what do you mean, Dad? I took last place. I biffed it on that. That hurt. I don't want to do this anymore. I said, hey, you got up. You got up and you finished the race. And I said, life's about that, isn't it? It's about getting up when you get knocked down and we're all going to biff it. And we've all biffed it. And you're going to meet people and you're going to work with people who have really biffed it. Just in this past month. You probably know a lot of people, perhaps you yourselves, are going through some pretty rough stuff. I have a good friend of mine who just found out a month ago that his wife's been having an affair for two years. So I talk to him, and I talk to him, and I go on drives with him, and he's really struggling. I'm hooking him up with a marriage family therapist. Another good friend just two weeks ago, diagnosed with cancer. Two months ago, I have a nephew, testicular cancer. Right? Family member of ours, divorce. 
there's a lot of stuff going on, whether it's health challenges, whether it was COVID or cancer or car accidents. Talking to my mom last night, she's been battling cancer for two years and liver, and she had her shot. She goes in once a month to get these shots in her rear end to help prolong her life. Say all of us are gonna experience these ups and these downs, this craziness that we call life. So I'm gonna to share today, I'm gonna to share eight words. Eight words, that's it, you guys. Eight words that I have found to be resilience. If I were to define resilience, I would say it's this. It's search inward, it's turn outward, it's look upward, and it is pressing forward through the struggles in life. First one, let's talk about searching inward. I like to, first, um, before I, I launch into those, big picture, all of us are born in this life with at least three fundamental needs. Human needs, every single one of us are born with the same needs. First need is the need for safety, to feel safe. This is physical safety, this is emotional safety, feeling like I can risk with another person, this is a romantic partner, this is a teacher, this is in class, feeling like I can say something and not be laughed at or put down or if it was wrong. So feeling fundamentally this is safety, food, clothing, shelter. When this need is met, the feeling is a feeling of peace. It's like, okay, I don't have this worry, this anxiety, this concern. Second need we're all born with is the need for satisfaction, to do fun and enjoyable and engaging things. This is pizza and ice cream or as well as Lagoon or Disneyland, but this can also be professional development, learning, growing. This, this yearning for learning, this desire to acquire, moving toward rewards, and when we have that, we're doing life is, is fun, it's enjoyable, it's engaging. There's a feeling of contentment, like, yeah, life is good. The third is the need for connection. All of us are born in this life with this, this longing for belonging, this craving for connection with other people, whether that is in roommates, whether that's in romantic relationships, faith communities, and young babies, we call it attachment. This is critical for all of us, this feeling of, I feel like I belong, I'm connected, I have my tribe, my peeps, and we're able to do a lot of fun things together. Okay, we do this through, through um, kindness and gratitude, through fun things, uh, appreciation, all of that strengthens that feeling of connection, and the result is a feeling of love, that I feel love. Now, COVID-19 happens, boom, it hits. It was one of the few things historically, you look at through history, very few things have had a profound of, uh, of effect on our well-being as COVID, why? Because it has a pandemic and sickness, no, 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 why? Because it was the, one of the few things historically that knocked out all three needs in a matter of days. Think about it, safety, Masks and vaccines, all that stuff, craziness. Satisfaction, you can't go bowling, you couldn't go to school, you couldn't go out to eat restaurants, nothing with your friends. Connection, couldn't see, I couldn't see my parents or neighbors or those in the faith community. It was nuts. That's why there was the big dip. In fact, historically, we hit an all time low for happiness and well being. Not surprising, but why? It's, it's this. See, when our three fundament, fundamental needs are met. Safety, satisfaction, and connection were more likely to flourish. At least we're in a better position to be open to influence and, and flourishing. So keep those in mind. Now, many of you are familiar with this. I remember Reuben Hill, right? ABC Action. You've kind of seen this. And so I'll talk a little bit about this, assuming that many of us know this, the stress model, there's a stressor event, and how that event affects us and our level of resilience or crisis comes down to largely two big rocks, two big areas, our resources and relationships and perception, how we perceive the stress or event. So people can go through COVID or through cancer or anything else, the exact same type of thing, but they perceive it differently. And they may have different access to resources and different relationships that help them through that struggle. So two people, can, one can really flourish, another one flounder, depending on our perception and our resources and relationships. So let's talk about searching inward. Searching inward, I like, I love talking, I'm very much strength based. Now, you know, physical strengths, dancing and singing and that, that's great too. But I'm a bigger fan of discovering and using our inner strengths. What are those strengths? This is a free assessment. How many of you are familiar with Martin Seligman? Kind of the father of positive psychology. I love his stuff. This, this assessment you take, and it will crank out your top five, he calls them your signature strengths. 
And I'm a huge fan of that. I have my signature strengths. I actually printed them out in a Word doc, cut them out, taped them to the bottom of my computer screen so every single day I'm focusing on my strengths. Secret number one to happiness and resilience in this life. The happiest people on this planet, they know and use their strengths and they manage their weaknesses. Don't focus on weaknesses and try to, no, I'm gonna improve this weakness. Focus on your strengths and manage weaknesses. In fact, recent research, I just read this article the other day, so I just put this up for this presentation right there. Character strengths predict resilience over and above. Positive affect, self-efficacy, optimism, social support, self-esteem, and life satisfaction. Now those are all important, but they found that above those, your strengths, knowing, using your strengths. So again, I encourage, I, I make my students do it, I force my wife and my kids to do it as well. Know your strengths and then use those strengths. Okay, number two, part of searching inward is living true to your core four. Your core four values will be a compass and a guide that will help you through your life, especially in times of struggle. You rely on those four. So what is, what are my values, Dr. Dave? It's not things, it's stuff that you value, but it's actually a part of who you are. For example, everyone in this room, it's gonna kind of take a grim turn here. All of us are gonna die, okay? Just saying, secrets out. All of us are gonna die. Now, this is your funeral. Oh, okay, this is really grim. You're up here now in a casket, and now someone is gonna be here, maybe a traditional funeral. Someone's gonna be up here and they're gonna be talking about you. Now, if they can only say four words about you and your character and the kind of person that you are, what four words do you want them to use to describe you and your life and how you lived? The kind of person that you are. Does that make sense? Have you ever thought about that? Better start thinking because, you know what? I don't want people to get up and be like, Dr. Dave, he was so frugal. <laughs> I might just come up right out of the casket and be like, what? You're kidding me? You're calling me cheap? Right? I, I don't want that. I don't know about you. Even hardworking. My dishwasher works hard, man. I don't, I want, no, that's not what I want. How do you want people to describe you? This is a list, and it's not an exhaustive list, but you really need to think about your values because your values will be your compass. And if you have kids or plan to have kids, you better be knowing how am I going to teach these values by how I live, by actually what I say. Now, mine up here actually are spell the word chap. I'm just going to tell you. C-H-A-P. Okay, I actually have it tattooed on my finger, so I'll never forget. C-H-A-P, okay? No, I don't, you guys, that's weird. Don't do that, don't do that. Okay, just seeing if you're paying attention. But they're, they're tattooed up here, okay? Right, I know those. It's compassion, humility, appreciation, and positive. I wanna be a kind person. I wanna be a loving person. I'm striving to be humble. I wanna be grateful. I wanna be a positive person. That's what I want them to say about me. Now, if you know your core four and you live true to those, then when life happens and stress happens, the goal now is to live true to your core four and act on your four, not on your feelings. That is one of the biggest struggles in this life. When life gets stressful and your values are tested, this is often what happens. Here's my values and here's my behavior. Maybe I, I slipped and I said something I shouldn't or yeah, I reacted to my kids and ah, 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 yelled at them or whatever. And now you see this gap. I call that the guilt gap. The gap between our ideal, our values, ah, and our behavior. All of us will experience this guilt probably every single day of our lives. We're working. We're working to align our behavior and our lives with our beliefs and our values. The closer we can align those, the happier and more peaceful and joy you'll have in this life. That's a huge secret. Align your values with your behavior. You're gonna blow it and I blow it and then we're gonna feel guilty. Get back up there and strive. Now, over time, I'm not perfect at this, but I'm getting better that when I'm tempted to be, oh, to become a nuclear reactor is what I call it, instead of a first responder, and when I will nuclear react to something, I think, oh, Dave, is this going to violate one of your core four? Because if it is, don't say it. Don't do it. Now, and I'll still slip, but the closer we can align our values with our behavior, the happier, more peaceful you will be in this life. So 
your homework assignment. You need to do your, your character strengths. What are your strengths, talents, gifts? What are your core four values that guide your life? Okay, another part of searching inward is not comparing outward. So here's another big secret, you guys. All you have to do, the recipe for unhappiness and misery in this life, all you have to do is switch those two words around, right? The secret sauce for happiness and peace, resilience, is search inward, turn outward. The recipe for misery, switch the two words. Search outward and turn inward. And that's it. That's what I've discovered through the science and through life. Those people that try to search outward and selfies and oh, Hollywood happiness, if I just do all this, 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 and if I'm searching outward, you'll never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. You will never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. My wife's like, oh, I object. Shoes and purses. I can never get enough of those. She said, I'm like, ah, well, I don't know about that. Do you see that? When people search outward, it causes them to turn inward. When I'm inward, I can't even see you or care about you because I'm so focused on myself and I'm trying to search for happiness out here and you'll never find lasting happiness out here. That's the secret. Search inward. What are my talents, gifts, strengths, values? Turn outward and stop comparing ourselves to others. Another part of searching inward is learning to enjoy and give attention to the present moment. The happiest people on this planet are those who have learned to enjoy their day, period. They've learned to enjoy, to be present with, to focus on who I'm with and what I'm doing in that present moment. Because what happens in life, all of us experience emotions, duh, Dr. Dave, in the present moment. Okay, when else are you going to experience an emotion? Okay, stick with me. But many of our emotions are anchored either in the past or in the future. For example, look at this list of emotions. Look at this. Anger, sadness. Like, I can, be, I can actually make myself sad. I can make myself angry by thinking about the argument that I had with my roommate or my spouse or the person who cut me off. You can actually start to feel those feelings of sadness, grief, anger by going back to those emotions, replaying them in your mind. Yes, I'm experiencing it now, but it's anchored where? In the past. Now, what I'm not saying, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't experience these emotions. These are horrible emotions. Okay, that, I'm not saying that. We're humans. We're meant to experience all these emotions. What I'm saying is don't set up camp in the past. It's okay to, to look in the rearview mirror of life, but don't, don't stare. You're going to miss everything else that's going on. These are anchored in the past. But when you're grieving, be all in grieving, right? Someone has passed away or something tragic has happened. Don't be like, okay, I just need to smile and put on a happy... No, 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 no. Experience that emotion of grief is very, very real. Experience that and cry. Let it out. Ugly, ugly cry. Let it all out and be there. But be mindful about it. So don't go, don't go weeks and months of constant weeping. That's not a healthy place to be. Okay, what about future emotions? Take a look at this. Where's anxiety and stress? Man, we're just like an anxious nation. Isn't that like historic levels? Where is anxiety and stress and worry, concern? Where is all that anchored? It's in the future. It's things that haven't even happened yet. Now, I'm not saying stress and worry. Yes, there's things that you need to worry about and stress about, but when we're constantly absorbed in the future, what are we missing out on? Right here. Isn't that crazy? The here and now. This is the feelings of joy and peace and happiness, and I'm rolling around with my two-year-old or talking to my teenager or out on a trip with my partner or loved one. Be, be all in, present, right then. Enjoy now who you're with what you're doing. Now, yeah, you can see some of these optimism and hope and looking forward to something is, is awesome. Looking back on appreciation, and that's great. Those are wonderful. So the whole point of this is mindfully choose where your emotions are going, what you're experiencing, be with it. Don't just go wherever the feeling goes and whatever I'm doing. At least be mindfully aware. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm worrying again about my teenager or their choices or my, my, my son. It's okay, but don't keep going back there over and over. I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. He teaches, <clears throat> your mind is like a piece of land planted with many different kinds of seeds. Seeds of joy, peace, mindfulness, understanding, and love. Notice those are in the present. Seeds of craving, anger, fear, 
hate and forgetfulness. These many different kinds of seeds, they're always there sleeping in the soil of your mind. And then he says this, the quality of your life depends on the seeds you water. If you plant tomato seeds in your gardens, tomatoes will grow. Well, maybe not in Cache Valley, but just so if you water a seed of peace in your mind, peace will grow. When the seed of happiness in you is water, you'll become happy. When the seed of anger in you is water, you become angry. Then he says, the seeds that are watered frequently are those that grow strong. When I read this, I had to put the book down. I was like, what? That's crazy. I'm the one holding the watering can. And too often I give it, either to my spouse or my kids or to a politician or anyone, right, that I disagree with. And I'm like, yeah, make, make me, yeah, keep going, keep going. That anger, she's getting real, stir up, keep water on that one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're the master gardener. You have that watering cran. The quality of your life depends on the seeds that you water. So be mindfully aware of those seeds. Point number two is turn outward. So we search inward. That's always about you, not in a selfish sense. Okay, searching inward is not a selfish way. Turn outward is never about you. And that's the secret sauce to happiness in this life. It's not about you. Turning outward is always about others. One of the best ways, this is, this is not rocket science, and everyone knows this, but the science now has really exploded. Dr. Robert Emmons, I love this, these books, by the way, um, Thanks and <clears throat> Gratitude Works. He says, we know from studies that gratitude helps us recover from loss and trauma. Holy smokes. Anyone experienced loss or trauma in their family or in your own self in the last few years? He says, this is the key. He says, it helps us to deal with the slow drip of everyday stress as well as the mass of personal upheavals in the face of, and then he goes off, suffering and pain and loss and trials and tribulations. He says gratitude is absolutely essential. He says it's part of our psychological immune system. Okay, holy smokes. How many of you even knew we had a psychological immune system? Okay, not me. I, physical immune system, yes. What's the purpose of that? So we get sick, right? It doesn't completely prevent sickness, but when we are sick, we have a strong immune system. We're able to get healthy quicker. We recover faster. And we take what vitamin C and fish oils and essential oils and all this other stuff that's out there. All these supplements, why? To boost our immune system. Again, it doesn't prevent us from getting sick, physically sick. Just so. We have a psychological immune system. And when that is full and it's strong, it doesn't mean you're not going to have hard days. It means when you do experience that trials and struggles and tragedies and stress, you're able to be more resilient and you're able to see things more clearly. Barbara Fredrickson, um, positive psychologist, actually she wrote a book called Positivity, one of my, probably my top five books I've ever read. Positivity by Barbara Fredrickson. She, she talks about this broad and build theory. Through her lab, she's been able to show that negativity narrows. Negativity literally narrows our vision. When we are stressed and negative, we can't see all the possibilities. We can't be creative with everything else that's going on in our life. Positivity, it broadens and builds. So when you have a reservoir of positivity in your life, then when the stress and the struggle come, we perceive it. Do you remember back to Reuben Hill, the ABCX? Resources and perception. You perceive things differently from a different perspective when you're full of positivity and happiness and gratitude and kindness. So here's some, here's some happy hacks. Here's some gratitude hacks. Number one, three good things. They've done research studies. The people who have even a little journal, even in your phone, you write down three good things. Three good things and why you're grateful for those things and why they happened that day. I love this exercise. If we had more time, I'd have you pull out a piece of paper and I would have you jot down the top 10 people, places, experiences, and things in your life that you're so grateful for. Because really in this life, you can only be grateful for people, places, experiences, and things. And so you jot those down. Take this as a homework assignment. Wouldn't be Dr. Dave if I'm not giving you homework. And start making that list. Now you're going to get to 10. I want you to go to 50. Who are the top 50 people who've made a difference in my life? Start with maybe five, right? And be like, okay, yeah, friends and family and close people in my life. And then those experiences that made you who you are, those defining experiences, and then places that you love to visit. This experience is powerful because when people are actually doing it and they're writing it down, who are they not thinking about? They're not thinking about themselves. And that's the key to the happiness. 
it expands their mind. They start going back. Gratitude is always backwards. They're going back into their minds about these experiences, these people, these, these things in their life. And they jot them down. And then when they're going to the grocery store and they're in line, instead of scrolling social media, they're like, man, I am grateful. I'm grateful for my dog, right? I'm grateful for electricity. These are adding to this list. And then you send them a letter. You go to that list of the top people in your life, and as a wise person once said, he said, we should never fail to thank those who have taught us well. We should never fail to thank those who have taught us well. As soon as he said that, I started writing letters, handwritten letters to former high school teachers and a scout master and people in my life. I thought, man, I've got a lot of people to be grateful for. I need to start that. now. If on that list you have someone that has passed away, you can still write the letter of love, of gratitude, of appreciation. In fact, I encourage you to do it. They've done this in studies and they set up a chair pretending like my grandpa is there or whoever that person is that's deceased. You sit down and you read the letter out loud in front as if they're right there or at the cemetery. It's a powerful experience. Bring a box of Kleenexes because there's gonna be tears. Write a letter. You can email it, you can call it, you can send it to your, your parents or whatever it is, but write that letter. Now you can also do this in reverse. Back my 30th birthday many years ago, all I called up my parents and I said, you know, hey mom and dad, I know it's kind of weird to ask for a present, but I'm gonna ask both of you for the, the gift. And the only gift I want from you this year is this. I want a letter, a handwritten letter from each of you as if it was the last letter you would ever write to me in this life. Please put in it that counsel, that direction, the types of values you want me to have, the things you want me to never forget, the things that are so important to you. And I have those letters and they are treasures. Because you know what? We don't know when our clock stops ticking. If your parents are still alive, ask for that letter. Okay, now if you're older, some of them are older, and you have kids, write that letter. Ask them for a letter to you as if it's the last letter they would ever write. It's a treasure to me. More than any, any kind of money, that is a treasure to me. I just pulled it out a few weeks ago and I read through it again. I think, man, I'm so grateful for my parents. Make those visits, read it out loud to them, send it, email, call, Facebook, FaceTime it, write those letters, powerful. Okay, one of the things we do in the SRAM fam, not very difficult, this can be done at the dinner table, it can be done as I'm taking them to soccer practice. In our family, we do it at nighttime, right before our kids go to bed in our family, we have a family prayer, and then I say one thing that made me grateful or happy that day. It's called our happy thought, we've been doing it for 19 years. Me, and then my wife, and then each of our kids, just share something that they're so glad that happened that day, Something that made them happy. It's a great way to end the day. Now, lest you think like, oh man, Dr. Dave and his perfect little family singing Kumbaya every night and hugging Kate. No, 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 no. No, there are nights when it's like, okay, my happy thought is your butt's in bed and your butt's in bed and get to bed, dang it. Yeah, so it's not all peaches and cream, but you can start little traditions of this happiness. And it's like planting a little drip, drip into their reservoirs of psychological immune system. Mental subtraction. Go back up to your top 10 people, places, experiences, and things, and you just mentally subtract. What would my life be like without my dog? A hot shower, right? You just mentally subtract. What would it be like without my mom? Or my boyfriend? Or whatever it is, mentally subtract those things. You can do this anywhere, mentally subtract. It's a great exercise to help you. Okay, this one I came up with several years ago. It's, I just call it text two before 10. You just text two people before 10 a.m. a text of love, of appreciation, of, of gratitude. In fact, dang it, we're gonna do it right now. Pull out your phones. I know this is really risky. Okay, check Instagram because you're gonna do it anyway. And then, okay, before you do it, in your minds, just think for a second and just say, okay, who needs a text from me right now? Now, if you do that sincerely, there will be a name or a face will come into your mind. Send them a text, just 30 seconds. The more specific, the better. And just send them a text. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna let you do it. I'm gonna take a drink. 
Send a text of love, of appreciation, gratitude. I'm going to take a picture of everybody and send it to my wife and be like, they were all on their phones, babe. It was the worst. It was the worst ever. They were all on their phones. Okay, now finish up your text or whatever. Keep going. Can you imagine if everybody in the world, did, heck, if even a million people, heck, if even just those students at Cedar City, right, at SUU, did this every single day, even three days a week, even on the weekends, do you see what I'm saying? Can you imagine the ripple effect that, that would have? You try it for a month, that's 60 people. You're like, doctor, I don't even know 60 people. Yeah, yes, you do. Pull out your yearbook and just start texting people. No, no, don't, don't do that. Don't be a creeper. No one likes a creeper. Okay, now some of you are going to get a text back. Well, some of you are going to get a text back. So it's like, um, are you okay? You're, are you all right? Okay, now if you get one of those texts, it might mean you need to text a little bit more often than once every never, Okay. At least a specific note on gratitude. Now, some are going to get a text that's like, um, what do you want, right? So, again, it may mean that you need to text them a little bit more often. But can you imagine trying this? Put this in your phone at 7.30 or 8, whatever. It pops up, and you're like, oh, yeah, text you before 10. Who, who needs a text from me today? And you check in with someone who is sick or has a parent who's, who's sick or has a big test coming up or has a struggle. Do you see that? Because if you treat everybody as if they're going through a pretty rough task, pretty rough, to, you're going to be right more than half the time. Just send it. Send it. This will change lives, but it takes 30 seconds. You want to make a real difference? Text two before 10. Just try it. Try it for three days even, and you'll be hooked. And you'll have relationships and all kinds of things. I remember one time I was, I was talking about this. And someone came up afterwards and they said, Dr. Dave, you'll never believe it. I felt like I should be checking with this person. I just felt like over and over and over. And now all of a sudden you, you told me to do it. And so I'm like, okay, I need to check in with her. She immediately texted me back. And she said, I can't believe you just texted me right now. We need to have lunch. I'm really, really struggling. Having suicidal thoughts. And we really need to get together. You don't know what they're going through. Send a text. It's one of the easiest ways. And it increases your positivity and well-being and potentially, you know, lunch dates and stuff. Just saying, right? Text. Text two before 10. Okay, now I've done this all across the country. I received some interesting ones back. This one says, hey, having a great time at my conference. It makes me realize what a special family we have. I love you both. Greg's like, who is this? He's like, wrong number, lady. Okay, now if you get one of these, it might mean... A little bit more often. What about this one? Hey, sweetie, just think about how sweet and kind you are. Who is this? Your husband. Is this meeting that dull and uninteresting that you're texting me? So again, you get one of these. Text a little bit more, a little bit more often, right? Okay, gratitude is, is powerful. Kindness is king. And all the studies that have, have, that have been done, Martin Seligman says, doing a kind act produces the single most reliable momentary increase in well-being of any exercise that they have ever tested over the last 25 years, since 1998. They've been doing these studies about what is it that increases positivity and happiness and peace and well-being in people's lives. Kindness, they say, trumps everything else. You want to be happy, you turn outward and do something kind for someone else, like text two before 10. Put it in your calendar. Because if you don't, you're going to forget it and be like, oh, yeah, what was that? Small and simple little acts of kindness. I mentioned earlier, treat everybody as if they're going through a difficult challenge. And you'll be right more than half the time. And in the end, it's better to remember, be remembered for your kindness rather than your greatness. It is. Come back to your funeral. They're talking about you. Do you want, do you want them to talk about, oh, yeah, she was such a great volleyball player? Or... 
Do you want them to say, man, she was one of the most kind, gentle, and loving souls that ever walked this earth? Be remembered for your kindness, not your greatness. Okay, number three, look upward. So we're plowing along, increasing in positivity and hope and meaning and purpose in our lives. I saw this is a, a social media post from one of, a friend that we had in Columbia, Missouri, and she gave me permission to post this. I zoomed in purposely on this first, and then I'll, I'll zoom out. But there you see a dog and you see a pickleball net, okay? Now, just looking at the size of that dog and the size of the net, how, raise your hand if you think that that dog, if it really wanted to get over that, could probably run and jump over that net. Yeah, pro most likely, just look, kind of looking at the size of that dog. Okay, now let me zoom out and I'll read her, her post. She says, Stanley's a pretty smart guy, so this surprised me. He suddenly didn't know how to get around the pickleball net. Well, I called him. Here's the kicker. It's been there for a few years, you guys. He even gave a half lazy effort to try to jump over it. He sat there looking at me like, come on, man, open the, open the gate. Okay, now humorous at first, and I thought it was as well. I was like, oh my gosh, that is so funny. Now, at least two lessons from this. How many of you in this room have ever had stressors and challenges and struggles? Trials, tribulations, and you felt like the net was that close in your face. Yeah, you can't even see how high it is because you're right up, your nose is up against it. You can't even see down to the end of the net because your nose is up against it. And it's in your face, you feel overwhelmed, I can't go another day, this is really overwhelming for me in my life. Now, what is not helpful for people to say in that situation from up at the top? Is it very helpful to be like, hey, hey, you moron, just go around the net, right? Just jump over the net, it's not that hard. Not helpful when we're, our face is up against the stress and the trial and the struggle, is it? It's not, it's not helpful. Sometimes we're the dog and sometimes we're the owner up at the top. We have a different perspective. Be patient with those who are going through the stress and the struggle because you don't know how close they are to that. And offering these simple solutions of, oh yeah, well you, you just go see a counselor. And then if you're so stressed out, be careful, be patient. And my favorite word in the English language, compassion. Compassion, compassion, compassion for those who are going through that. Because it's difficult to look upward when we're surrounded by all this stress that's pointing us downward. Another part of this, of looking upward, is this principle of we tend to notice and find whatever we're looking for in life. Have you, have you noticed that? We tend to find whatever, if we have a position, whether it is, it is political or religious or anything else, and you're scrolling on Facebook, immediately see somebody yeah, and they're saying something and you're like, yeah, I agree. Man, this is so good. I'm going to share this. We'll find whatever we're looking for. Someone you don't like walks into the room and you'll, you'll notice what they're wearing and how they're walking and even how they hold their fork will drive you nuts if you don't like somebody. We'll always find what we're looking for. Complainers will always find something to complain about. Grateful people will always find something to be grateful for. What is it that you're looking for? What is it when your eyes are upward? What is it truly that you are looking for? And you will find it. So look for and find the good. You'll see it. You'll notice it when we start looking for it more in our lives. Okay, this tr feeling of transcendence and awe. Uh, this is up at the Tetons, being able. How many of you have that experience where you've just, you've done something, you've hiked somewhere, you've held a newborn, you've looked up, whether it was the eclipse. How many of you saw the eclipse? Yeah, maybe not like saw it, but yeah, made through glasses. Yeah, that eclipse. Some of that is just this feeling of awe. You look up at the universe and you feel like, wow, we are so small, really, in this big vastness. When we look upward and find meaning and purpose and hope in this life, that's a good place to be. That's a great place to be when we feel the sense of wonder and direction. I like this, this term SOS. SOS, that signal of like, was it three long beep, 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 and then one, three short beep, 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 or however it goes, right? Three and three and three. That's the signal of distress for SOS. I, I need help. I like to say, what is your source of strength? What's your source of strength? What's your source of support? Here's the SRAM fam. Here we are. We're helping my, my good old uh, mama on the far left with a little project of, of putting all kinds of gravel and stuff and some rock in their backyard. And we all get together. So I have four sisters and a brother. That was an awesome experience. We rarely get together, but man, when the SRAM fam gets together, we have a lot of fun. 
they're a source of support. When my mom's cancer, we all get on the phone, we talk, we find that source of strength and support. Same with, uh, here's the Shram fam and our daughter um, in the middle. This is the one that had bunion surgery and the biffed it on the track, right? She looks a little bit better. I think she overcame it through some counseling and things. She's like, well, yeah, it'd be all right. What is your source of strength? What is your source of support? What are the resources, the people, the, the experiences? Where do you go? All this need to have the source, our go-to. This is one of many for us is, is family. Okay, pressing forward. Oh man, each of us are going to go through those hurdles in life. We're going to trip over those hurdles. But if we can get up, get up and win, win the race. In, in my mind's eye, I, I picture two circles, right? One circle is things that really matter. And I encourage people up at the top, things that matter. And then I say, okay, right, what is it that really matters to you? And put it in the circle, whatever it is. And the, old, the older I get, the older I get, I feel like I'm in this, right? The older I get, I'm getting gray hair. The smaller that circle is, you guys, I'm telling you. Things that I thought that really used to matter, like my, my favorite football team when they lost, oh man, I was depressed for three days and I was blaming the refs and the coaches. And What were you thinking? I, was, I thought that really mattered and I was so sad. I stayed off social media because my friends had read. I'm like, wait a second, what? What is it that really matters? And that's shrinking over time the stuff that really matters. And then I have another circle. What is it that you can control? Okay, I, I used to think you can control kids. <laughs> Holy cow. Wake up call when we had four teenagers, four teenagers at the same time. I was nuts. I used to think, yeah, we could control. But really what I try to focus on is that middle section. What is it that really matters in life? like truly matters, and what is it that I can control? And that little thin slice of life, that's where I try to put my time, my effort, the worry and the stress, that's what I try to do, is what can I can control, and what is it that really matters? Now, where do the source of our struggles come from in this life? Really, I think it boils down to three areas. Our circumstances, whether it right, COVID or cancer or stuff that just happens in our lives, we have zero control over. What about others' choices? Yeah, man, there's going to be some mean people. They're going to say and do mean things. You just get online. You start scrolling. You look over the Middle East. You see all of this. Others' choices. People are doing this awful thing. How much control do you have over that? <sighs> Very little. And then I point them to the top. And I say, yeah, you know what? You control you and your choices. The things that really matter, the things that you can control. This triangle of troubled times, take a deep breath and go back to what is your area? What's your locus of control? Where's the focus of your life? What can you really control? Now this can work for teenagers and others to help them understand a lot of stuff is going to happen. Mean, ugly stuff. Focus on you. Focus on what really matters. And that our resources, helping us to press forward in life. Talked earlier about that, the little model, resources and relationships, and all the, from creativity to having a pet. How many of you have a pet that you just totally rely on as just a source of comfort? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, we have a little Yorkie, a little five pound Yorkie named Max. And when I get home today, Max, for some reason, I don't like him, but for some reason he likes the person most who doesn't like him. And he's gonna come to me. Max is on kidney failure, actually. He should have died two months ago. And he's kind of on his, on his last days. But there's some little weird, quirky joy that I get out of making Max happy. It's not weird. He'll come up to me and he just loves his scratchies and I'll scratch, I'll rub his belly. And that gives me joy to make Max happy. I think, wait, that's weird, Dave. No, it's, it's not weird. It's not weird. There's this joy, this sense of, okay, I can get home from school or leave everything and just, yeah, it's for others. It's a music or it's an instrument or it is a hobby. It's going camping, it's writing, it's doing something, the sense of flow that you can rely on. It's a friend, someone to turn to as you're pressing forward in life. We all need that. What's your SOS, your source of strength and support? So search inward, turn outward, look upward, and press forward. Here's a few resources. Some of the people are like, oh man, I love this area. I love all this stuff. Uh, and I've listened, uh, the Blinkist is a subscription. Some of you may have heard of it. 
it's, it's a pay pers- um, um, service that you can listen to 15 minute version of books. They basically boil the entire book down to 15 minutes. They call it blinks. And I listen to the 15 minute. I listen to over 200 of these. And then the ones that I really like, then I buy. This is what I call my Dave's Faves list. Favorite book on, on anxiety? Oh, man, has to be Judd Brewer. So, so good. On uh, dep- It's more kind of this habits as far as depression. But he gives, man, over 100 of these small little science-backed happy hacks from sunlight to massage and sleep that can help us. It's called The Upward Spiral by Alex Korb. And then you see the Barbara Fredericks, yeah, Positivity book and Thanks and Authentic Happiness. These are some of my go-to books um, related to happiness and positivity and resilience in, in this life. Here's some resources. As I close, I, I simply share these. It's all free. I don't get anything. USU extension, that's my job is to get good stuff out of people. But I thought, you know, during the pandemic, where are people? They're on their phones, man. They're on their phones. So I had a videographer come in, in his mask. It was weird. Then I had him take it off. And we made like over 200 videos on parenting and positivity and marriage relationships, but I made them like two minutes and five minutes. I call it thrive in five, five minutes. And here's an awesome idea that you can do right now. Or a daughter day's two minute, Tuesday, two minute tips. And I just said, here, here's a little tip that you can do right now. Make it very, very practical. And so I have uh, USU said, you gotta have a YouTube channel. So I made a YouTube channel. I started a, a, a podcast last September with Dr. Liz Hale, a licensed clinical psychologist in Salt Lake City. And we just talk about relationships and about marriage. We bring on um, couples. We bring on therapists and authors and professionals. We talk about how to strengthen our marriage and our, our relationships. And then I, on social media, man, all this stuff, I don't sell anything ever. It's just giving out the best secrets on resilience and positivity and happiness and parenting, couple relationships, just getting it all out there, out of the books, and into simple little digestible um, ways of, of getting this, this information out there. Okay, um, I'm gonna end with this. I'm gonna come full circle and end with this. I didn't tell you the full story. So back to Chandler. She biffed it that night. She was at home, she's getting ready for bed. And I had heard a poem many years ago. I printed it out and I went downstairs and I showed it to her and we read it together. And this to me, and some of you may have heard of this, it's called The Race by D. Groberg, but I'm gonna read it because it's a, it's a powerful reminder of really what matters in life. Whenever I start to hang my head in front of failure's face, my downward fall is broken by the memory of a race. A children's race, young boys, young men, how I remember well. Excitement, sure, but also fear, it wasn't hard to tell. They all lined up so full of hope, each thought to win that race or tie for first, or if not that, at least take second place. Their parents watched from off the side, each cheering for their son, and each boy hoped to show his folks that he would be the one. The whistle blew, and off they flew like chariots of fire. To win, to be the hero there was each young boy's desire. One boy in particular, whose dad was in the crowd, was running in the lead and thought, my dad will be so proud. But as he speeded down the field and crossed a shallow dip, The little boy who thought he'd win lost his step and slipped. Trying hard to catch himself, his arms flew every place, and midst the laughter of the crowd, he fell flat on his face. As he fell, his hope fell too. He couldn't win it now. Humiliated, he just wished to disappear somehow. But as he fell, his dad stood up and showed his anxious face which to the boy so clearly said, get up and win that race. He quickly rose, no damage done, behind a bit, that's all, and ran with all his mind and might to make up for his fall. So anxious to restore himself, to catch up and to win, his mind went faster than his legs. He slipped and fell again. He wished that he had quit before with only one disgrace. I'm hopeless as a runner now, I shouldn't try to race. But through the laughing crowd, gosh, he searched and found his father's face with a steady look that said again, get up and win that race. So he jumped up to try again 10 yards behind the last. If I'm to gain those yards, he thought, I've got to run real fast. Exceeding everything he had, he regained eight, then 10, 
but trying hard to catch the lead, he slipped and fell again. Defeat, he lay there silently. A tear dropped from his eye. There's no sense running anymore. Three strikes, I'm out. Why try? I've lost, so what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, who soon he'd have to face. Get up, an echo sounded low. You haven't lost at all, for all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. Get up, the echo urged him on. Get up and take your place. You are not meant for failure here. Get up and win that race. So up he rose to run once more, refusing to forfeit. And he resolved that win or lose, at least he wouldn't quit. So far behind the others now, the most had ever been. Still, he gave it all he had and ran like he could win. Three times he'd fallen stumbling. Three times he rose again. Too far behind to hope to win, he still ran to the end. They cheered another boy who crossed the line and won first place. Head high and proud and happy, no falling, no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line in last place, the crowd gave him a greater cheer for finishing the race. And even though he came in last, with head bowed low, unproud, you would have thought he'd won the race to listen to the crowd. And to his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do so well. To me, you won, the father said. You rose each time you fell. And now when things seem dark and bleak and difficult to face, the memory of that little boy helps me in my own race. For all of life is like that race, with ups and downs and all. And all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. And when depression and despair shout loudly in my face, Another voice within me says, get up and win that race. When life gets challenging, it isn't fair and all hope seems lost, we still have a choice to make. We can become better or we can become bitter. It's our choice. Thank you.